This algebraic geometry lecture will describe two examples of projective varieties, the Veronese surface in P5 and the variety of all lines in space. We start with the Veronese surface. This consists of all points in five-dimensional projective space of the form x squared, xy, xz, y squared, yz, z squared. So you can think of this as being a map from the projective plane P2 to P5, where you take a point x, y, z of the projective plane to this point here. Well, obviously this map isn't on two because P5 is dimension five and this only is dimension two. So um, we would like to describe this subset of P5 by giving explicit equations for it. So let's write a point of P5 in the following form, W00, W01, W02, W11, W12, W22. So for example, W12 corresponds to the fact there's a Y and a Z where X corresponds to the number zero, Y to one and Z to two. So we want to find relations between these numbers W that are automatically satisfied for all these points. Well, it's pretty obvious. Um, we see that Wij, Wkl, is equal to wik wjl for all ijkl, where we put wij is equal to wji, corresponding to the fact that xy is equal to yx, and so on. So this is a reasonably large family of quadratic equations satisfied by all these points here. Um, And you can check the map from P2 to P2, the set of points satisfying all these equations is on to. Um, the proof is sort of similar to the way we showed um, the map from P1 times P1 to something was on to. And it's similar to the example we're going to give um, next of lines in space. So I won't actually give the details of this. Um, so this map can, um, can be regarded as a map from P2 to P5. We can also think of it as being a map from affine space A3 to A6 in some sense, where A6 we think of as being the symmetric square of the space A3. So symmetric square is um, just a way of saying we consider all degree two monomials in X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z are a basis of A3. So S squared of A n is dimension n times n plus one over two, which for n equals three gives us three by four over two, which is six. Um, of course, there's no reason why you should stick to symmetric squares. You could also map A3 to the symmetric cube of A3, which would have dimension three times four times five over one times two times three, which is equal to 10 and, and so on. And there's no reason why you should stop at A3. You can also have maps from AM to the symmetric nth power of AM. And this will give a map from PM minus one to P of something fairly large that I'm feeling too lazy. To. Um, so the images of these maps from projective space to projective space are all called Veronese varieties, and you can define them by a similar but more complicated set of equations. So the next example is going to be the variety of all lines in P3. 
So the idea is we want to find a variety whose points correspond to the straight lines in P3. Um, so let's stop and just think about what the dimension of it should be. Well, if you've got a line in P3 and you take a random plane in it, say this plane here, then the line will generically pass through a point in the plane, so that gives you two degrees of freedom, and then it can point in a direction in, well, in, in ordinary Euclidean space, direction will be a point on the sphere S2, so that gives you another two dimensions. So we expect this variety to have dimension four. Um, well, a point, so a line in P3 corresponds to a two-dimensional subspace um, four-dimensional vector space. Um, let's write that as a vector space rather than affine space because we're picking the origin. So we're picking a two-dimensional subspace of the vector space K4. Um, this is a special case of a Grassmannian. So a general Grassmannian um, GMN can be thought of as the set of m-dimensional subspaces of the vector space k to the m plus n. Um, so we can think about what these are. So g naught m and g m naught are just points. It's rather trivial. G1m is the set of one-dimensional subspaces of an m plus one-dimensional vector space. So that's just projective space, Pn. Gmn is more or less the same as Gnm, because here this is an m-dimensional subspace. of um, k to the m plus n. And we can look at its dual, in other words, a set of all linear transformations vanishing on this. So if we take the dual of this in k to the m plus n dual, which is just isomorphic to k to the m plus n, we get an m dimension, n dimensional subspace. So flipping M and N doesn't really affect this Grassmannian very much. So we see in particular that GM1 is also isomorphic to M-dimensional projective space. So the first non-trivial case that isn't a point or projective space is G22, which is equal to the two-dimensional subspaces of K4. Um, so, um, in general, um, Grassmannians are special cases of Hilbert schemes. So, a Hilbert scheme is a scheme which is a generalization of a variety we will discuss later, whose points correspond to certain um, configurations such as algebraic sets or more generally subschemes of projective space satisfying certain conditions. The simplest condition is that it should be a linear subspace of projective space, such as a line or a, or a plane or something like that. So Grassmannians are the simplest cases of Hilbert schemes, and G22 is the simplest non-trivial example of a Grassmannian. Um, so how can we, um, what we want to do is to try and make this Grassmannian G22 into a projective variety. Well, we will do that. We will embed G22 into five-dimensional projective space. So how do we do this? Well, pick a line in P3, which corresponds to a point of 
the Grassmannian. Um, and now we can pick two points on the line. So the first point will be A0, A1, A2, A3. And the second would be B1, B0, B1, B2, B3. Yes, these should be colons between them. So um, these are only defined optimal multiplication by scalars. And from, from these, we want to somehow produce um, a point in P5. So we need to give six numbers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these two things together, a, a naught, a1, a2, a3, b0, b1, b2, b3. And here I get a little two by four matrix. And now I'm, I'm going to put sij to be the determinant of columns i, j. So for instance, s naught one is the determinant of a naught, a one, b naught, b one, which is a naught, a one minus a one, so it's a naught, b one minus a one, b naught. And similarly for the others. So altogether we get um, six coordinates, s naught one, S naught two, S naught three, S um, one two, S one three, S two three. Of course, um, something like S three zero is going to be the same as S zero three up to sign, so there's no point in putting it in. And something like S one one is automatically going to be zero, so we can miss out those as well. Um, now notice um, this point of p to the 5 only depends on the line that we chose. Um, so first of all, if we multiply all the a's by a constant or all the b's by a constant, obviously all these determinants get multiplied by the square of that constant, so it doesn't change that point in p5. Secondly, we had a lot of choice about which two points were picked on the line. So um, we can pick other points by replacing B by a multiple of A. Well, this corresponds to adding a multiple of the first row to the second row in all these determinants, but that doesn't change the value of the determinant. So, so changing which points which two points of the line we pick, as long as these are distinct points, isn't going to change this point of P5. So we've got a well-defined map from lines in P3 to points of P5. Um, well, is this map onto? Well, no, because the lines in P3 form a four-dimensional space, and P5 obviously has dimension five. So not all points of P5 can be the image of a point of the form Sij, given by all these determinants. So there must be some relation between these numbers, Sij, and what is this relation? Well, the relation between them is the famous Plucker relation. which looks like this. It is S01, S23, minus S02, S13, plus S03, S12 equals zero. And this is easy to prove. Each term of the form A something times B something times A something times B something occurs twice with opposite sign. So everything just cancels out. There's a pretty good chance I got a sign error wrong in this somewhere and that they won't cancel out because the signs of the Plucker relation are a bit tricky, but modulo stupid errors I've made, um, this um, 
this plucker relation um, holds between these. Next, we can ask, are there any other relations satisfied by these points? And the answer is no. That if we've got a set of numbers Sij satisfying the Plucker relation in P5, then there is a line in G22 um, mapping to that point. So we want to show the map G22 maps mapping to the solutions of the Plucker relation is on to. Well, um, some Si, some Sij must be non-zero, so can assume it is one. So we may as well Assume that S01 um, is equal to 1. But then we know that S23 times S01 is equal to some combination of the other two by the Plucker relation. So S23, sorry, S23 is determined by. S02, S03, S12, S13. And now um, we can just pick the two points, 1 naught S12, S13, and naught 1 S02, S03. So here we can pick, um, here's a point, and here's a point. And so this determines a line in G22 with image the given point of P5. So any point satisfying the Plucker relations is indeed um, the image of a point of um, point of the Grassmannian. So we found a description of all lines in three-dimensional space. It's more or less the same as the set of points of this quadric in in five-dimensional space. So you remember a quadric just means the solutions of a degree two equation, and here we've got a degree two equation. So we can use this to do things like find the cohomology of a quadric in P5 over, say, the complex numbers. It doesn't really matter if you don't know what cohomology is because we're not going to make any serious use of it. What we notice is the Grassmannian. Um, is a union of the following subsets. Well, first of all, we can take all points of the following form. So this is a point of the Grassmannian corresponding to the line on line going along this point and along this point where star means any number we don't really care about what it is well that doesn't cover all of them because this coordinate might be zero so we should also include one something naught something naught naught one something notice by the way that if we choose this thing to be one we may as well choose this coordinate to be zero because we can subtract a multiple of the first row from the second to make this zero. And similarly, if this is non-zero, we may as well make it one and can then kill off this coordinate to make this zero. And similarly, 
if both of these are zero and this is non-zero, we can push them to this form. And there are several other forms the point can take as follows. Um, try and get this right. Naught, 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 one. That'd be star naught. And then the first coordinate might be zero. So um, we might get zero, one. Um, star, star, and zero, zero. Um, so that should be a zero, one, star, zero, one, star, zero, 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 uh, zero, one. And finally, we might get zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one. So we've divided the Grassmannian into six pieces. And you can see that these form six copies of various little affine spaces. So here we've got a copy of affine space A4. Here we've got A3. Here we've got A2, here we've got A2, here we've got A1, and here we've got A0. And this gives us a very nice cellular decomposition of the Grassmannian. So over the complex numbers, if you go to an algebraic topology course, you can see that the dimensions of the cohomology groups can be read off from this. So the zeroth cohomology group has dimension one, the second is dimension one, the fourth is dimension two, because there are two of these, the sixth is dimension one, and the eighth is dimension one. If you don't like cohomology groups, then instead you can use this to answer an alternative question, how many points, so how many points does the Grassmannian G22 have over a finite, field k. Well, that's quite easy to answer because um, over a finite field k, a n has q to the n points, where q is elements of the finite field. So since we've divided up the Grassmannian into disjoint copies of affine space, we see that the Grassmannian G22, or equivalent the quadric in five-dimensional projective space, has q to the naught plus q to the one plus two q to the two plus q to the three plus q to the four points. So you've got two copies of q squared because there are two copies of two-dimensional affine space. If you want to compare this with four-dimensional projective space, this has q to the naught plus q to the one plus q squared plus q cubed plus q to the four points. So we see that the Grassmannian G22 is definitely different from four-dimensional projective space. It's either got a different number of points over a finite field, or it's got different cohomology groups if you work over the complex numbers. Um, Incidentally, this relation between this this show this strongly suggests there's some relation between the cohomology groups of a variety over the complex numbers and the number of points of the variety over a finite field. Um, this is the theme of the Ve conjectures over finite fields, which give um, extend this to all varieties, basically saying the number of points of a variety over a finite field is closely related to its cohomology over the complex numbers. Um, well, the next lecture, we will look at more complicated Grassmannians.